and he doesn't give Musa alayhi salam the answer. Why? There's a reason. He could have just told him. Like today, in today's world, it's all about textbooks, right? Information. You go online, you find the information, right? That's not a good way of learning, by the way. That's not a good way of learning. If you give the education and the information on a silver plate to people, they won't appreciate it. You have to prime people for learning. You have to prime them for learning. How do you prime someone for learning? You arouse their uh, curiosity. You get them interested. You puzzle them and they start trying to understand. They realize, oh, there's something I want to understand here. I need to understand what that means. You arouse curiosity. Now, when you arouse curiosity and you keep them there for a while, when you teach them later on, they will understand it. They will absorb it. So this is why Al-Khadr did not explain to Musa first. Then he goes, after that, they go and find a young boy, right? What does Al-Khadr do? He kills the boy. That's murder. Musa knows this is, you can't, murder is haram. You can't murder. But he murders him. And Musa says, how come you kill an innocent soul like this? You're doing something that is extremely bad. So Al-Khadr does not explain. What does he say? He says, didn't I tell you that you won't be able to be patient? So Musa says, okay. Still, he doesn't explain to him. Then they move on to go to Musa says, now if I ask you one more time, you are free, leave me. Don't, don't, don't keep my company. I know that you are free to go. You have given me enough excuses, enough chances. <laughs> so they go to this town, right? They ask for food, they ask for hospitality, like you know, we guests, would you like provide us with food, hospitality? The guys, people of that town are miserly. They don't give them anything. They don't offer them anything. It's, it's not a comfortable situation, but a khadr finds a what? Find, finds what? A wall. And the wall is about to collapse. He goes and fixes it for free. Musa says, like, these people didn't even, they refused to give us food. You're doing a free job for them. Why? You should have just asked for some money and we could buy food with that. It makes sense, right? So a khadr says, okay, this is when our ways will depart. You go your way, I go my way. Now, since you're leaving, I'll explain to you. And now you are ready to learn because I did not give you the answers. I aroused you, I aroused you curiosity. I challenged what you know. What you know, okay, tells you that everything I did was wrong. Then he started explaining to him these things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the surah, biggest surah in the Quran, and probably at the beginning of the Quran, after the Fatiha, what does Allah start with the Quran with? Because usually people are going to read the Quran. They want to see what the Quran says, right? Okay, what does it say? For example, the Surah Al-Baqarah doesn't start by saying, That is the book. There is no doubt in it. It doesn't start like this. Because you would expect that kind of content. But the Surah starts with what? Something that seems up. What does that even mean? Like this is supposed to be a divine book from Allah, from the creator of the heavens and the earth. The, the miracle of the Prophet Wasallam. So when you are, go, back, go to the Quran, the first thing that hits you is Alif, Lam, Mim. In a sense, like in English, let's say someone sends you a letter or you hear someone is very intelligent, they've written a beautiful piece of writing. You take it and the first thing you'll find is, for example, A-L-M. What does that mean? That's arousing curiosity. That will get you to say, what does that even mean? Okay. What is he trying to say here? That will allow Allah doesn't give you exactly what you want straight away. Why? Because Allah wants to hold it back from you. Still, why? Because He wants to arouse the level of curiosity. Allah wants you to really mean it to learn. And by the way, this is very common. You see, when you give information free to people, they don't appreciate it. They don't appreciate it. Oftentimes it happens with parents. <laughs> You come and give your child unsolicited advice. You say, you know, my child, when you do this, that's no good. It's not going to help you. They're not interested. They're not interested. When do they get interested? When they do the thing and they get in trouble, okay, and they see the consequences. Now they go come to you and they say, oh, what did you say previously? Now they understand because the curiosity has been aroused. There's some kind of experience. They see the value of knowledge. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is, again, is not giving us, okay, is not 
a straightforward, okay, get into the Quran. No. Allah is going to challenge you with three letters, Arif, la Meem. And you're going to ask, what does that mean? What is Allah trying to say? The moment you start thinking about that, you're already involved in the Quran. You're already involved in the Qur'an. By the way, the Prophet ﷺ used that a lot in a different way. One day the Prophet ﷺ wanted to teach the companions about the gravity of sins. Like when you wrong people, okay? The Prophet ﷺ wanted to demonstrate to people how bad that is. He could have said, you know, when you wrong people and like you slander someone or you uh, hit someone or you hurt someone, you're going to pay for that. Well, yeah, yeah, okay, we understand this. But how does the Prophet convey it instead? He says to the companions, Who is the bankrupt among you? <coughs> who do you consider someone who is penniless? He has nothing. Like they, they hit rock bottom. Who, are, who is the person? They thought, well, well, that's an easy question, right? A uh, person who's bankrupt, someone who doesn't have any financial assets. Zero. Like their bank account is zero. The Prophet says, you know, the bankrupt person, now they, no, they're already thinking. Like you're asking someone something that's so obvious, who's a bankrupt person, who's penniless, right? But the problem, they realize the Prophet is up to something, now they are what? They are involved, they want to know. He's trying to get to something, right? What is it? The Prophet says the one who is bankrupt is the person who comes on the day of judgment, has done prayers, has done siyam and fasting, has done hajj, has done sadaqah, has done so many good things, so many good things. So, but he has hit that person, he's eaten the money of that person, he's wronged this person. فَإِذَا فَنِيَتْ حَسَنَاتُهُ أُخِذَ مِنْ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ فَطُرِحَ تَقِيهِ فَطُرِحَ فِي النَّارِ So, on the Day of Judgment, he has to pay them back. You wrong someone, you have to pay them back on the Day of Judgment. How? They're going to take from your hasanat, good deeds. Take from, they will take them, they will take them for them and you will lose them. And if you run out of good deeds, their evil deeds, their sayyiyat, their sins will be taken from their records and thrown in your records. And you will have to deal with them. Isn't that more profound? Than just saying, hey, if you if you wrong someone, you're gonna pay for that on the day of judgment. Huge difference. Why? He got okay, he got them primed for learning. Again, Allah, that's what he when they uh, one way of doing that in the Quran is by starting with these random letters. Alif Lam Mim. Now Allah is talking about the Quran. Allah starts introducing the Quran. That is the book. That is the book. There is no doubt in it, or no doubt about it. Hudan lil muttaqin. By the way, a good introduction is build the structure. At the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, what does Allah do? Allah classifies humans into three types. Three main types of people. Believers, believers, Disbelievers, people who refuse the truth, and hypocrites. This is a very useful categorization, by the way, in religious matters and in personal matters. So, religious matters. People are three types. Mu'minun, people who believe, accept the truth. People who refuse the truth. People who refuse the truth. Kafaru, okay? Refuse the truth. And the third one are the hypocrites. That's what Surah Al-Baqarah starts with. Believers, disbelievers, and hypocrites. So Allah now is going to start talking about the Quran by ref referring to the believers. Allah says, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ That is the book. Allah, Allah is talking about the Quran. So the Quran is referred to in the Quran, it was referred to in many ways, but two main ways, Kitab and Quran. Kitab means it's written. It is written. Kitab from book. It is written, format. And Quran is recited. It's being recited. Because the Quran is both written and recited. The Quran is both written and By the way, one mistake. It's a linguistic mistake in Arabic. 
When I say this as a physical entity, what do you say? People say Quran, right? No, the Quran is the words that are in it. This is called Mus'haf. Mus'haf. The physical book is called Mus'haf. What's written in it is the Quran. There's very subtle difference. So next time, this is why when I asked you, give me what? The Mus'haf, right? I said, give me the Mus'haf. Give me the Quran. Give me the Quran means teach me the Quran. That's what it means. Atil Quran, teach me the Quran. Teach me. Because the Quran is recited. Okay? So Allah says, Dalik al Kitabu. It's written. Where is it written? It's written in a Lawh al Mahfuz. The Quran is first written in a Lawh al Mahfuz. The preserved tablet above the seven heavens. That's where it's first written. Okay? The Quran is Allah spoke the Quran. Allah spoke the Quran. And the Quran is preserved in the preserved tablet. Okay? Then the Quran was revealed orally from Jibreel, taking it, hearing it from Allah. Then he carries it to, the Muhammad, to Muhammad وسلم, and he conveys it to Muhammad وسلم, orally. That's how the Quran was revealed. Then the Prophet وسلم, taught it to the companions orally. Orally. Some of them started writing it down. Some of them started writing it down. And they have used to have their own parchments. Okay? So that is the kitab. Allah say about the Quran. This is the Quran. Or that is the Quran. La There is no doubt about it and there is no doubt in it. So the Quran, there is no doubt in it. Somebody might say, but there are people who don't believe in the Quran today, right? There are people who read the Quran, but they still have doubt about it, right? And the Rayyib, by the way, and this is a question for the Arabs, those who know Arabic. The word Rayyib is translated as doubt. But also we have in Arabic, doubt, we have shak. What's the difference between shak and Rayyib? What's the difference between shak and Rayyib, those who know the Arabic language? Both of them in English are doubts. Why does Allah use here? Why, why does Allah say that? No doubt, no raib. He doesn't, doesn't say la shakka. Still, I'm not getting it. Shak is in your heart, rape is in your heart. Excellent, yes. Yes. Shak is a is a thought process. You just okay, I'm not I'm not sure cognitively, is this right or wrong, right? Raib is a description of your heart, the state of your heart. So this is why, for example, the Prophet says Al Kadiburiba lying causes riba, like raib, riba, raib, the same word, almost the same word. Why? Because raib and riba means you have doubt about something and it causes you anxiety. This, uh, you know, distress, unrest, okay? I could, I could have doubt, for example, I could have doubt, you know, let's say for example, is St. Catherine's, is it to the north? Or is it to the east or is it to the west of Niagara Falls? I have doubt, but it really doesn't bother me, right? This is this is check. Check. Like there's no emotional side of it. But Arayib, okay? Arayib is when the matter concerns you and you are troubled about that. I need to know the truth about this. I need to know the truth about this. Okay, you see the difference? So check is just an idea and doesn't have an emotional side to it. But raib means you have doubt and your heart is burning. I need to know. Like for example, how is raib? Uh, you work for a company and there are layoffs. They're gonna release some people and say that you have no job anymore. See you in the next life, okay? You can go back home, we don't need you anymore. So, but they, they you don't know, like you're going today to work and you don't know whether you, you're going to be kept in the job, you're going to keep the job, or you will be told, take whatever money you know you, you, have, you, you deserve, okay, and leave, that's it. We don't need you anymore. Now, before you leave, 
the house that morning, you're really troubled. You don't know, am I going to still keep the job or am I going to be kicked out of the job, right? You don't know. And your heart is burning about that. It's causing you stress and anxiety. You're troubled about it. That's right. That's right. So Allah is saying here, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ There is no such state in regards to the Qur'an. No such state. لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ There's no doubt in it. Now that's not the complete meaning. I haven't completed the meaning. I will come back to complete the meaning. هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Huda, guidance. What does guidance mean? That means when someone is lost, you give them the directions. That's what Huda basically means. Someone is lost, you give them directions. That's Huda. That's Huda. You give them accurate directions. That's Huda. Lil Muttaqeen. For the pious. For the pious. So Allah is here making a conditional statement. The Quran, there is no raib about it, there's no doubt and trouble about it, and it is guidance. This is only with who? The pious ones. The pious ones. And who are the pious ones? The ones who are really seeking the truth. And that's the beauty of the Quran, by the way. Somebody might say, you know, if you read the Quran, it's going to tell you the truth. No. Wrong. The, and that's part of the miracle of the Qur'an. Now, I haven't finished my statement. I'm arousing your curiosity now. Part of the miracle of the Qur'an that it reveals to you and it reflects back to you the state of your heart. You approach the Qur'an with genuine curiosity. You want to learn. You want to seek the truth. The Qur'an will guide you. If you read the Qur'an and you already discounted the Qur'an and you already think it's wrong, the Qur'an will not reveal itself to you. That's the miracle of the Qur'an. And Allah says in the Qur'an, Allah says in Surah Al-Kahf, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ And we reveal from the Qur'an that which is healing. Shifa, healing, warahma and mercy للمؤمنين, to the believers. Again, the muttaqin, to the believers. So if you are a believer and you approach the Quran, the Quran is going to give you more iman, more healing, more guidance. وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَرًا But it only increases the wrongdoers in loss. So if someone is misguided and they approach the Qur'an with the wrong intention, someone approaches the Qur'an to prove it's wrong, for example. Someone approaches the Qur'an and they want to read it as a way that thinking it was written by Muhammad. The Qur'an will not reveal itself to them. It will not give them the guidance. It will not. Why? Because if, oh, in order to read, the, this is the Qur'an. That, you can't read the Qur'an only with your mind. And that's the miracle of the Qur'an. In order to benefit from the Qur'an, you have to read it with your mind and with your heart. 